scientists are really starting to get their head around this stuff. Um, a lot of what people call snake oil or woo-woo science is now coming, becoming mainstream. And so I think that very shortly we will go before the Big Bang. And there's a lot of history in the Amazon and places like that that say that there were pre-physical societies before we came into being. And I think that science, scientists can now see virtually back to the Big Bang. And very shortly, I believe, they will go beyond the Big Bang and they will realize what came before it. Well, a physicist, Sir William Tiller, may be one of the few to even talk about what he believes happened before the Big Bang as well. Uh, and well, I think I that's, also, that's dramatic. And I also, I, I mean, I spoke a lot to um, a guy, a, a, a medical anthropologist. His name is Dr. Alberto Velocco. He uh, formed the Four Winds Society. He used to work at San Francisco University, and Velodo uh, talks of pre-physical societies, and he went to live in the Amazon um, for 25 years to work with the great shamans of the Amazon, and he now helped me to understand shape-shifting. He helped me to understand about orbs. Like, for instance, he says that at the moment of physical death, all the information in our seven chakras uploads into an eight chakra, which is above our head. Um, and when I, for want of a better word, moved from this world to another on that Easter Saturday all those years ago, me, Hazel, I was on the ceiling of my bedroom looking down at this thing below me, and it took me a while to realize that the thing was me. And yet, me, my consciousness was on the ceiling. And so I said to Tilly, uh, sorry, I said to Belodo, have I become an orb? And he said, but Hazel, it's all so exciting, he said, because you're a field of information. And so when you leave your physical body, you're only shedding part of who you are. But the field of information that makes you is still there. And so then you are existing as consciousness, but you are now no longer constrained by our space-time. So you can now be anywhere at any time. And this is terribly exciting. Like in Countdown, I've written an awful lot about our potential to move around in space and time. And I went to Italy to visit a very, very enlightened society. They're called... Damon Hurrians, and they live outside Turin. And one of the people there said to me that time is a space that you can navigate. There is so much now opening up that previously would have been thought of as being crazy. And in fact, I suppose you could say that 95% of the world's population still think of this stuff as crazy. They don't even acknowledge that consciousness survives physical death. But when you get people like Gary Schwartz and many others saying that when people examine the totality of the evidence, then it's now up to the skeptics to prove that life does not go on. And so there is a huge body of evidence out there for all this stuff. Um, what you have to do is actually put your attention on it and read the evidence, and then you think, wow, there really is something going on here. And so it's our job to get this information to the ordinary man in the street to help him to understand that he is far more special than he can ever begin to imagine. And... Um, Bruce Lipton, people like uh, cell biologist Bruce Lipton, in his brilliant book, The Biology of Belief, he explains how the mind, mind and intention form patterns which form matter. And so in the moment that I totally believe something with my whole heart and mind, I achieve total brain coherence and objects can come into this reality. So when fully enlightened men and women manifest objects. They're not manifesting nothing from nowhere. They, sorry, something from nowhere. What they're doing is organizing energy, mind and intention form patterns that form matter. And so scientists know this, but they don't know the actual mechanics of it. And this is why they've got the Hydrogen Collider in Europe, because they're trying to find out how energy 
becomes physical matter. But there is no doubt that it does happen. Can you imagine the metamorphosis that even you have gone through now, Hazel, since this episode? I mean, you, oh, I went, mean, you, you went from one extreme to the other. I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just that I've learned so much. And it's like, even now, even now, like when I talk, when I say have a, a lot of these scientists have become friends. And even now, when I talk to people like Professor uh, Fred Travis at this Center for Cognition and Consciousness, and I, you know, he, he tells me things that just blow my mind. For instance, the other day he said to me, he said that in the moment between um, waking and sleeping and in the moment between sleeping and dreaming, our consciousness passes through this underlying field of intelligence, which is, of course, everywhere, simultaneously, at all times. And he said, these are the moments when people can see the future. These are the moments when people are astrally traveling. These are the moments when you can get incredible insights because you and your mother, father, God, are for those few moments as one. And when he explains all of these types of things to me, I have these wonderful aha moments. So we're all learning, we're all growing. And for every, for every time somebody tells me something like this that's really, really, really exciting, it just enthralls me. You know, it's the only game in town to know that we, should, we, we come here to become who we really are. Well, I, I got to tell you that uh, it's dramatic if it works for you and if you believe in it. What about people who don't believe in it, Hazel? Can they still? I think that, you know, I think everybody is free to choose. I'm not trying to um, be dogmatic about this. I mean, there are currently 20,000 religions on this planet. You know, we have enough people telling us how to think and what to think and what we're supposed to do. Uh, There's an awful lot of people. I mean, think how many people over the centuries have died because or died thinking, I'm going to go to hell, you know? And yet the theologian Michal Ledworth explained to me that hell derived from when Jesus told people about an area outside Jerusalem called Gehenna and Shahol, which was a rubbish dump outside (laughs) Jerusalem. Which probably was hell to them, right? That's it. And apparently the word metamorphosed over the years into hell. And Jesus, there was no such place as hell. Um, it was a rubbish dump outside of Jerusalem. That's funny. Was, Hazel, we're going to take phone calls with you when we come right back. Sure is. And we're going to take your phone calls with Hazel Courtney right now on Coast to Coast AM. Hazel, do you think we all have the capability of creating miracles Absolutely, I do. It's our birthright. And once people understand that and decide to, you know, start looking into all this stuff, then, you know, yes, we're absolutely all capable of miracles. I've got absolutely no doubt about it. All right, great. Let's go to some of the calls. Jody is in Seattle, Washington, and you're up with us on Coast to Coast. Hi, Jody. Hi, George. First of all, it's the first time I ever called. I've been listening for years back when Art Bell started back in Virginia, and now I'm in Seattle. But God bless you what you do, man. Glad you got through. Go ahead. And, and uh, she was talking that, you know, if we're good, it says right there in the Bible, if we're going to be sons of God, then we'll have the same power, right, as Jesus. We're here to learn to be, get godly character. And I was wondering, I could suggest a guest for you. Uh, member of my church, the Philadelphia Church of God. You ever heard of it? Yep, King sure David. have. And, and all the readings, I've, I've got Crohn's disease since 2006, just got diagnosed. So I had plenty of time. And, and, and thank you for turning me on to Zachariah Sitchin. And, and I, he was right. They created us. But if you read a certain part in there, it says that even the Anunnaki said there was a creator of all things, a God for their good. They were gods to us, but they, they've got a god, too. There is a creator. And uh, I just want you should check into some of his. Uh, it comes from Herbert Armstrong's writing. And, and you ought to check into it, the key of david.com. It makes a lot of sense if you look up and read about it. But uh, what they say 
you know, all the people worried about the end times. I see until the Jews have the sacrifice and the uh, de- uh, the uh, statue gets the uh, desecrate the temple, like it says in Daniel in Revelations. I don't think we have to worry, but I do believe we're in the end times. And here lately, I've had a lot of it's like something broadcasting, keeping me on edge, like you talk about. I really believe that. But hello. Okay, great. That's a good comment. We'll check into that individual, too, as well. Let's go to Mike in Lawrence, Kansas. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Uh, I had a, uh, I've kind of struggled with my spirituality over the years, and I, I was agnostic forever, and I'm starting to align a little bit with Buddhism and have been studying a lot. And I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the Four Noble Truths. I'm not going to go real deep into it, but... It, the first two is uh, uh, life means suffering. That's the first one. And then the second one is the origin of suffering is attachment. And then it goes into, you know, our minds are attached to impermanent things, you know, and uh, all these transient things instead of uh, uh, things that lack per- or that have permanence and whatnot. And, uh, uh, you know, that's just everything that we perceive is impermanent. You know, so I'm wondering uh, if, if if attachment is what we're trying to transcend with this concept. How do things like love play into that? Wouldn't love be an attachment? Well, I don't know, but uh, Hazel, you have talked about love. Um, I think that love is everything. I mean, if we could all learn to be more forgiving, and if we can let go of guilt, um, that the world would be a better place. And I really do not believe that life means suffering. Um, We might be divine spirits having a physical journey, but, you know, we can also have some fun along the path. Um, And so, yes, I believe that attachment to stuff and to things, a lot of people equate happiness with how much money they've got in the bank or how much stuff they own. But as you say, they are very impermanent things. But God, or what we think of as being God, is ever-present, is eternal and everlasting. And so once we realize that we are all eternal and everlasting, yes, this world is impermanent, but we we could make this earth heaven on earth if we would just behave differently to each other. You know, there's all these wonderful phrases, you know, treat people as you would like to be treated yourself. Like what's going on now in Libya or Bahrain, and there's so much unhappiness in the world, but we could, all of us, make it a happier place if we could practice more forgiveness, if we could let go of guilt, and if we could just be kinder to each other. And just doing that, Adds, because every thought that you have contributes to the whole which we I- exist inside of. So the more positive thoughts we can send out to the whole, the more actions, positive actions that we can take add to the whole, and what we give out is what we'll get back. Do you sense so love that, is 